All right, let's go ahead and open up to Romans 12. Uh, last week, uh, we just did a little bit of a review of agape love. Luckily, we had done a lot of work with agape love in chapters five and six. Tonight, I'm just gonna uh, wrap up just a couple final points, and then we're gonna go back to verse one here of chapter 12 and start looking at these two verses. Almost every word in these two verses, why don't we just read the two verses to kind of get it set up here. I beseech you, this is Romans 12, verse one, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present yourself, you, excuse me, you, ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, almost every word in those two verses uh, is something important. It's, it's a whole gold mine just waiting to be dug into. Uh, and so what we're going to do now, what I tried to show last time uh, is that everything in uh, the, these next few chapters, really, as you go through the rest of Romans, it's all about agape love. That's the regulating factor. As you go into Corinthians, that's going to be the main thrust of the Corinthians. That's what they were missing and needed most. You go into the Galatians, that's going to be the answer to the Galatian problem. You go to Ephesians, that's going to be the answer to the Fle uh, Ephesians uh, Christian life. Uh, from here on out, everything has to do with this. So that's why I think it's worthwhile uh, to just wrap up some final things about this agape love uh, because I think the, its value, uh, its appreciation, maybe be a better word, uh, is missed by a lot of people because this is really uh, the thing through which we walk in a, well, in a way that's well-pleasing to God. We participate in things uh, whereby he works in and through us and everything done that way, everything done through agape love is acceptable to God. And we'll see that as we go through here. Uh, but I'm not going to redo this. We talked about this last week. I'll just put the slide up here. Uh, in chapter 12, he's going to talk about the assembly as a whole and how it, uh, pr how it acts and does things in the world. Uh, it starts out by the assembly as a whole and the people within the assembly, and then the assembly as a whole uh, with those that are outside the assembly. And it's, it's all going to be regulated by love. Then you get to chapter 13, and now you have individual believers going out into the world, interacting with the government, interacting with their neighbors, interacting with bankers and lawyers and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the regulating factor in that is going to be agape love. Then you get into chapters 14 and 15, and he's going to talk about that weak, weak brother, strong brother thing. And guess what the answer there is? agape love uh, and that's going to be the main regulator there and you could just keep going you could spring out of romans and into first corinthians their divisions you know what the answer to their divisions is agape love you know what the answer to their sexual immorality is agape love you know what the, uh, their use misuse of the of the spiritual sign gifts agape love everything is going to be regulated by this and that's what we're going to see as we go through here in these next chapters and so we'll just finish up a couple final points I didn't quite get finished with last week. Uh, this agape love that comes from Pauline Grace, it only comes from Pauline Grace. Uh, you can't find it anywhere else in the Bible, and you'll see why as we go to the next couple points. It's not found uh, in the extra biblical writings. You can't go to the writings of that day in the Greek world and find the word agape and say that must be how Paul, God and Paul are using it in Paul's scriptures. It won't work. Uh, and you can't even go to the non-Pauline scriptures like John to find out how the Bible, how God uses the word agape love because he's gonna do something with it in this mystery program, this dispensation of grace 
through the apostleship of Paul. And if you don't rightly divide, you're not going to understand agape love. But it's the most, once you have this information, once you have this positional truth, once you know about your justification uh, and unto eternal life, uh, your right standing before God, once you know your sanctification, that he's placed you in Christ as a member of the body of Christ, once you know, that's, and that's the first eight chapters of Romans, once you know your place in God's uh, historical plan, and purpose, uh, the mystery program, that's Romans 9 to 11. Once you know all that, it's made you a lot smarter person. But if you don't use it with agape love, you're just puffed up, full of knowledge, uh, and it doesn't mean anything. The thing that's going to regulate everything now is agape love. The goal of dispensational approach to scriptures with bringing so much clarity and understanding to God's word isn't to make someone smarter than other people, uh, one-up them in their Bible knowledge, uh, you know, show they can do Bible acrobatics and have all this. The goal is that they use that information, that knowledge, not to puff up themselves, not to build up themselves uh, directly, but to build up the others. And that's the key. If you don't go that extra step, uh, it's just, as Paul says a couple places, uh, it's just a lot of hot air. 1 Corinthians 13 would be a place to start with that. So if you don't rightly divide, it's good to rightly divide. It clear, opens up the scriptures, get, lets you know what God's actually doing today. Uh, but you need the, another ingredient. And that's what Paul's going to pick up here in chapter 12. It's this agape love because Paul's other distinct teachings, uh, Paul used, just like Paul's other distinct teachings, Paul uses the word agape different than all other Bible writers. He uses it different than the writers, just the extra Bible writers out in the Greek world, and he uses it different than even the other scripture writers in the word. Uh, so you can't go to John to find out how Paul uses the word love, agape love. Uh, you have to go to Paul to find that out. So outside of Paul's, outside of Paul's scriptures, agape is just a general word uh, that with little specific meaning of its own. It can be used as a general term for a variety of loves. Agape love in the Greek language was kind of like our word love. You know, you think about it, love really doesn't mean anything, right, on its own. You need a context. Love can refer to familial love. If I say I love my sister, that's one kind of love. I love my wife, that's a different kind of love. Uh, people talk about falling in love. Uh, you can have sexual love. You can have the love of the God in the Bible. And it all falls under that one English word, love. It really doesn't have any meaning of its own. It requires a, con <coughs> a context to know what that love is referring to. Well, agape, uh, outside of Paul's writings, is kind of like our word love. It can mean a whole bunch of different things. It doesn't have a specific meaning of its own. It can refer to familial love. It can refer to uh, brotherly love. It can refer to different kinds of loves. It's like our word love. But uh, some, God's gonna do something with that love so that it's distinct. Uh, and so when we go to look for Paul's use of the word agape, uh, you, uh, you cannot define Paul by going to uh, John. Uh, and you see this, some people doing this when they come to Pauline passages and they say, uh, God, Paul can't be using it uh, the way that some people say uh, because John doesn't use it that way. And I would just answer, well, that's the whole point. It's he uses it differently than John. You can't go to John. For John, agape love, he, John uses the form of agape love about uh, half of the times, the number of times that Paul does, even though he's written uh, a lot of material. Uh, so it's not, uh, he doesn't use it as often, but for him, it's a verb. 
It refers to doing what is right and best for others and is used uh, basically interchangeably with other love words like uh, phileo, you can remember that one, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That's going to be the key other love here, phileo, the brotherly love. Uh, and uh, he, it can be used interchangeably with that. Go to like John 21. John 21, and you can just see how this works here. John 21, verse 15. John 21, verse 15. He's, we're going to see this go back and forth. How does, Paul, or how does John use the word agape uh, in the sense of love? Verse 15. So when they had dined, remember the background here, uh, Peter had denied Christ three times. Now this is after the resurrection and Jesus is going to make him say he loves him three more times, kind of to get him over uh, the three denials, get him beyond that. And so he's going he's to uh, talk to Peter about, do you love me? Verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest, and that's the word, that's, a form, that's the verb for agape, agape, thou, do thou lovest me, agape thou me, more than these. And he said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love. That Peter answers with the word phileo, brotherly love. And so they seem to be somewhat interchangeable. Look at verse 16. He said unto him again, he's going to do this three times. And the second time Simon said to Jonas, lovest thou me? Again, that's the, a verb form of agape. And Peter says, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, phileo. Brotherly love, agape love. Agape love is just a more general word. And for John, phileo love is included in that. Kind of like, again, how we use the word love in English. But now look at verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now Jesus uses the word phileo. He uses the same word Peter uses, and Peter responds. Uh, and he says, you know, Lord, uh, all things thou knowest that I love you, phileo. Now my, my uh, point here isn't to give you a lesson in Greek words. Uh, we don't speak Greek, we speak English, but this is one case where uh, I don't think it's going to be taxing uh, to learn one Greek word. Uh, and here for John, agape and this phileo, brotherly love and agape love, are basically interchangeable. And that's uh, wh the way John uses it. That's the way the non-Pauline scriptures use it. That's the way the extra biblical Greeks used it. But Paul does something different. For Paul, agape love is mostly a noun. It's a thing. It's a substance. It's a noun that is a special distinct and is special and distinct from all other love words. It's the love of God displayed at the cross of Christ and that believers can now participate in that love uh, and extend it to others, share it with others, extend it with others through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's what Paul's talking about. He refers to it. It's a substance. It's a something uh, that belongs to God, but it's not uh, God doesn't keep it to himself. God gives it to us, the believer. And we'll see that as we go through some more points here. So why, the good question uh, I've had is why does agape in, the, in John uh, only a general and inclusive word? Uh, in God's prophetic program for the nation of Israel. Uh, and this just goes back to the most fundamental aspects of right division. Uh, the most fundamental aspect of right division, what is God doing in Israel's prophetic program? He is, man in the most basic terms, God is manifesting his righteousness in saving his friends and destroying his enemies saving the brethren and the, the sister ends, the sister and the sister, brothers and sisters, uh, saving his friends, saving his own people and destroying his enemies. That's what God is accomplishing. That's what God is manifesting in Israel's prophetic program. He's going to save his friends. So the greatest love, while you're here in John 21, hopefully you're still there, flip back a couple pages to uh, see something here, go to chapter 15. 
in Israel's prophetic program, God is saving his friends. And you can see it anywhere. We looked at the Psalms of the last uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, and almost every Psalm, that's what David's praying for. Date God, when are you going to save your friends and destroy your enemies? That's the whole point. That's what he's manifesting in Israel's prophetic program, how he's going to save the brethren, how he's going to save the brothers and sisters, how he's going to save his friends. And so agape is interchangeable with brotherly. They go together. And we see it again in who Christ died for in Israel's prophetic program. Look at John 15, 13. Flip back a couple pages and go to John 15, 13. Greater love, this is the greatest love in Israel's prophetic program is this, John says. That no man, uh, love hath no man than this, that a man, and of course the man here he's talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ, that a man lay down his life for his friends, for his brothers and sisters. And it's because of that, it, that is the basic fundamental understanding of the two distinct uh, portions of scripture, the Pauline scriptures versus the non-Pauline scriptures. In the non-Pauline scriptures, God is manifesting his righteousness and saving his friends, the brothers and the sister, his brothers and sisters. Therefore, agape love is a general word that includes brotherly love. That's what he's displaying in that program. Uh, that's why they're fairly interchangeable. But now let's go on. What about Paul? Let's look at Paul. Why, in God, why did God have to uh, come up with a new word? Uh, or let's, let's just say he didn't come up with a new word. Who, who had to infuse the word agape and change its meaning uh, with regard to God's mystery program for the body of Christ. Why did he have to take that work and change its meaning? That word and change its meaning. Uh, why does agape love in Paul's epistles mean something different than what John wrote about? And it's because, again, the very fundamental thing. If is in Israel's prophetic program, God is manifesting his righteousness in saving his friends, his brothers and sisters, and dying for his brothers and sisters. What's he doing today in God's mystery program? Today, he's saving his enemies because he has no friends. He's saving ungodly sinners on enemy status before him. The whole world has been brought together on enemy status before him. In God's mystery program, he's remanifesting how he saves his enemies because he has no friends. And in the God's mystery program, he explains how Christ not just died for his friends, that was the greatest love in Israel's prophetic program, but how he died for his enemies, for ungodly sinners on enemy status before him. And the world, the Greek world or any other world, any other human uh, culture or language didn't, doesn't have a word for that. There is no word. There is no human word. There's, a, there's human words for people uh, dying for their friends and their brothers and their families. And their, but there's no human word for someone, especially God, dying for his enemies. And not only his enemies, but ungodly, sinful enemies. God needed, there wasn't a word for God to use for that. So God took the word agape. And he took it, it's a general word, didn't have a lot of meaning on its own, was interchangeable with, uh, with just a broader word for other loves. He brought that over and gave it to Paul, and he filled it full of his own meaning. And that's why agape, having this understanding of agape love, this one little tiny Greek word that we're all familiar with, is so important. Let's go now and look at uh, Romans 5. Romans 5, and we'll see this where it's, Paul just spells this out in explicit terms. Romans 5, verse 5. Today, God's saving his enemies. Today, uh, it's made known that he's died for his enemies and not just any enemies, ungodly, sinful, uh, wicked enemies of his. 
But look what he pick it up here at verse 5. Romans 5, verse 5. And he's going to bring out the two programs. And he's going to show the difference. Verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We look at the love of God displayed at the cross of Christ. And when we believe that, the Holy Spirit takes that love and overflows our hearts with it. Fills our hearts with it. And then he goes, pick it up at verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, and this is the reason, when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for us. Verse 7, here we have uh, what John was talking about. Uh, in the prophetic program, out in the world, and in the, God's prophetic program, uh, it could be said, this could be said, verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure... Uh, for a good man, some might even dare to die. That, see, that's the greatest love John was talking about. That he would die for the righteous. He'd die for his brethren. He'd die for his own. He'd die for the good. That's the greatest love in Israel's prophetic program. But that's not the greatest love there is. The greatest love there is, verse 8, but God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And the world uh, even the non-Pauline scripture world didn't have a love word for that. So God took that general purpose uh, of little uh, content of its own love. He brought it over and he filled it full of his own definition, his own meaning. And he gave it to Paul and he said, this is the love I'm commending today. Not just that I died for my friends, but, or the righteous, or the good, or the strong, uh, but I died for the weak, the ungodly, sinners, enemies. And I'm going to take this word, this Greek word agape, and I'm going to fill it full of my own meaning. And that's what agape love is. Uh, he, he takes it and makes it his own. God claimed the general world a little of its own meaning and then filled it with his own meaning. The love of God at the cross of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit is now pouring out in a believer's heart uh, when there's a response of faith, the Pauline grace. And that's what motivates the believer now. It's the only motivation God accepts. Absolutely only motiv motivation God accepts is the motivation that comes through the love of God at the cross of Christ. If we look at it pictorially, someone is asking about my diagrams here. I guess let's go back. Uh, oops. Let's go back to this one. Uh, this is the extra biblical writings outside the Bible uh, and the, in the Greek world and the non-Pauline scriptures. Uh, and agape love was just kind of like a bigger circle that included all the other loves. You could find phileo, brotherly love, eros, kind of like our word love where you have the love on the outside, and then you have all other kinds of loves. You have to read the context to know what the specific love uh, is being referred to. But that's in the non-Pauline scriptures. For Paul, this is the way love works. Agape love is the geyser love. It's the fundamental love. It's the thing that squeezes, that pushes out, that overflows, that avalanches, uh, that the Holy Spirit takes and pours out and avalanches, forms a geyser in our hearts. And it's that geyser that motivates, compels, uh, uh, pushes forward, constrains, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, the believer, and that's the source of all other loves. A whole different concept. A whole different concept. Now agape love uh, isn't just inclusive of all the other loves. It's 
the source. It's what all the other loves are based on. All the other loves uh, have to come out of this most fundamental of all love for the believer. It's the starting point of everything. It's the geyser that produces the Christian life and our walk and experience. So that's the geyser, uh, the geyser that's involved there. Let's go ahead uh, and let's just read this over in 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians and you can see this for yourself. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Uh, for the love of God, there's that agape love again. The love of God, uh, excuse me, for the love of Christ constrains me. And where did Christ display his love? Where did God display his love? At that cross we just read in Romans 5. Uh, and you read here in verse 15 as well. But for verse 14, for the love of Christ constrains me. It's what squeezes me. It's what gushes me forward. It's now become the motivating, uh, compelling force of my life. That's why uh, I think it's important to spend some time understanding this agape love. It's the geyser for the whole Christian walk. Anything done through this is acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Anything done apart from this is not acceptable to God. No matter how good it looks to the world, no matter how it looks good to your friends or family, or anything apart from this isn't acceptable to God. It all now comes out of this agape love. You're either motivated and pushed forward by the love of God at the cross of Christ, uh, and that's always acceptable to God, or you're not operate on that basis and it's not acceptable to God motivated by the love of God at the cross of Christ uh, he's working in and through you producing uh, the the work or the action or the whatever uh, is happening there uh, and so of course it's always acceptable to him he's the one that does it he's the one that says in Philippians 3 uh, uh, Philippians 2, I should say. Uh, he works in and through you. Maybe we should just go ahead and turn there. Philippians 2. Make sure I got the right chapter here. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, uh, verse 13. For it is God. Remember, right, the first uh, eight verses of chapter 11 is all about agape love, right? We've been over that a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. Uh, verse 13, and right after that it says, "For uh, it is God which worketh in you. When you're operating on the basis of agape love, it's not you doing it. It's God working in and through you. It says here, for God which worketh in you both to will and to do, and not he, he's the one that gives you what we read about in 2 Corinthians, find the motivating, the compulsion, uh, compelling you forward, uh, geysering you forward. And he empowers you to do it. He does it in and through you. It's verse 13, for it is God that worketh in you both to will it, so you want to do it, you, you choose to do it, and to do it of his good uh, pleasure. All right. So that's where we are with this uh, agape love. This is where for Paul, agape love is distinct uh, from all other words for love. The reason uh, we have to uh, you re preface it with the word agape, uh, the only time I regularly use any kind of Greek word, because we don't speak Greek, we speak English, uh, and uh, the only time I do it is for this, because none of our English Bibles clearly differentiate these things. None of them do. And of course, the reason none of them do is because they've been translated by people who don't rightly divide the scriptures. So they don't pick up on these things. So it's important uh, to see the change that's gone on here with the change in programs and purposes uh, and plans of God uh, through this mystery program in the dispensation of grace. So for Paul, it's distinct from all other words for love. It is something that only believers, here's what I was trying to point out earlier, uh, this is something only believers can do. 
uh, as one who received the love of God at the cross of Christ can participate in a share. By very definition, a believer is someone uh, who has received the love of God at the cross of Christ. They've heard the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ uh, and the love of God displayed there. They believe it and they've received it. They've responded out of faith in accord with it. Uh, this is what separates the unacceptable apparent good works of an unbeliever and the acceptable good works of a believer. Uh, you, this is what, uh, you can have a believer and an unbeliever do exactly the same work from what it appearances on the outside. But uh, God isn't fooled, is he? God isn't fooled. Uh, God doesn't look at the external work like we do. What does he look at? He looks at the inner man. He looks at the heart. Uh, and when it comes to God's judging, he doesn't judge based on the external work. He judges based on where that work came from. And that's, of course, we've been over that in Roman, uh, Romans 2. Anything done out of agape love is accepted by God because it is the result of his love put in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this is something the unbeliever can't do. By very definition, the unbeliever is someone who has rejected the love of God at the cross of Christ and doesn't have the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 says. So there's, the Holy Spirit isn't pouring out uh, agape love into his heart, overflowing his heart with that. By very definition, an unbeliever is, uh, ha is, has rejected Pauline grace truth, doesn't have a created new heart, doesn't have the Holy Spirit taking up abode in that heart, overflowing his heart with love. That's the very definition of unbeliever. And remember, way back in chapter 2, Paul set this up. He explained God doesn't look at the external works. If you're going to end up being judged before him, the thing you need to know is he doesn't look at the work. He looks at where the work came from. If it, uh, and we use an example, which I still think is a pretty good example, that blue bunny ice cream and the Listeria scare. You know, all those government officials, all the officials at Blue Bunny, all the government, fish, national and state government officials, none of them cared about your pint of ice cream, your quart of ice cream, or your gallon of ice cream. None of them said, uh, we're going to go and check every vat of ice cream that's out there. What did they say? What was the only thing the government officials cared about? All they cared about, to look on the outside of your container and see where it was made. And if it was made in the plant that had Listeria poisoning, it's automatically sent for destruction and condemnation. It's automatically rejected. You don't have to analyze with the, no one cared about the, the container of ice cream. As a matter of fact, millions of people ate the ice cream from those plants and didn't get sick or didn't, didn't die. Didn't matter. Everything that came out of that plant that had, was contaminated with Listeria automatically is consigned to condemnation and destruction. Send it back to the store, throw it in the garbage, get rid of it, whatever you got to do. That's how God looks at the, at, the hum, at the humans, sinners. Uh, either you're involved in his things 24-7 uh, and uh, operating out of the plant that runs on the power of God, cleansed with the blood of Christ, uh, run with the righteousness and life of the Holy Spirit, and everything out of that plant is automatically acceptable to God. But there's one other plant in town. If you reject God and his plan and purpose and his good gospel, uh, then there's another, you're operating out of another plant in town. It's the plant that runs on the basis on the power of sin and, and Satan. And everything in it is contaminated with death. And automatically, no matter what it looks like on the outside, it's automatically consigned uh, to destruction uh, and uh, and condemnation. And that's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. A believer is one who at least now has the possibility of responding on the basis of the agape love the Holy Spirit is pouring out in his heart. And that allows God to work in and through them. 
and everything produced, every step taken in that way is always acceptable. It's automatically approved of God. And that's why this love thing, now is going to go on through all the rest of Romans, all the through Corinthians, all through both uh, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, it's the basis of everything. And that's what separates a believer from the unbeliever. This is the difference. A believer by definition is one who's rejected the love of God at the cross of Christ and doesn't have the Holy Spirit in his heart. Uh, so he doesn't have the love of God being poured out in his heart uh, and versus the believer who has. He at least has the potential. Now, unfortunately, believers still also have the option of uh, operating out of the flesh according to their own selfish interests. But when they respond in faith to Pauline grace truth and they're uh, looking at the love of God at the cross of Christ, the personal work of Christ on that cross in faith, then the Holy Spirit takes that, overflows their hearts with it. That can then now motivate them to serve God by serving others selflessly rather than selfishly. So both the believer and the unbeliever can do the exact same work, but the unbeliever's work is rejected because it flows out of a selfish heart contaminated with sin and death. The believer's work is accepted because it flows out of a heart, or at least has the potential of flowing out of the heart, uh, of a heart overflowing with the love of God at the cross of Christ. And that always results in selflessly giving to others out of righteousness and life. And that's always acceptable to God. So when we get to Romans 12, 1 and 2, and he talks about our acceptable service uh, and his acceptable will, uh, and all that kind of thing, this is what he's talking about. This is what differentiates the believer from the unbeliever. This is what differentiates the carnal believer from the uh, spiritual believer responding out of faith and God and his word. All right, so now let's go. That's uh, where I'm going to leave off the agape love. Hopefully it's, uh, it's brought up uh, a little bit of the importance, brought out a little bit of the importance Let's go back to Romans 12, Romans 12, and let's start taking a look at tearing apart this verse, these couple verses. Uh, we won't do this with every verse in the chapter, but uh, this verse uh, is so chock full of information. I stole this from an old pastor I had years ago. He called these two verses uh, kind of the not in a bow tie. I don't know if that looks much like a bow tie. But everything uh, that we've gone through so far, I throw in Ephesians 1 to 3 here. We've, we've covered quite a bit of Ephesians 1 to 3. Romans 1 to 11. Everything's been heading to this point, And it's all kind of summarized up here. Uh, brought into the knot of 12, 1 and 2. And then uh, once you get through verse 2, then that opens up. This whole and it expands into this whole uh, experiential, uh, practical, I guess some people say it, uh, the everyday walk of the believer. And he's going to, again, in chapter 12, he's going to talk about it in the assembly as individuals uh, with each other. Uh, and he's going to go through all that. Uh, so I thought I'd, I stole this from someone. And the key there is that presenting uh, your bodies a living sacrifice. But we're going to have to start at the beginning here. Let's look at the word beseech. And I think right off the bat, bat you'll see why uh, we're really stressing the love concept. And uh, it's that agape love concept. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. All right, so we're going to look tonight for the remainder of the time at this word beseeching. Uh, notice that he's beseeching. Uh, he's not commanding. He's beseeching. Uh, beseeching calls for a heart response, a response from the heart, a willfulness uh, to, uh, to engage in God, with God and his things. It's a, can only come, it's a response that can only come again out of love, that agape love that flows out of Pauline grace 
uh, by the Spirit working in the heart. Uh, that's the only way it can be done. And we just read that uh, in chat Romans 5 uh, down through verses 9 and 10. Uh, and that's what this whole center thing is here, this whole beseeching. It's kind of like all summed up in that word, these two verses. Uh, you know, I remember once in Sunday school, I had a Sunday school teacher. I think he was a president or a vice president of some kind of steel company. And for uh, a little tour with the Sunday school class, he took us to a steel company. And I remember he took us to this place and they had all these huge cars just sitting there, just junk cars all over. And uh, all of a sudden, this huge electromagnet came over, got over one of those big old Cadillacs, put, go, put down, and as it started to head down towards the Cadillac, the Cadillac just went whoosh, right up and stuck on that electromagnetic. And then that electromagnetic, uh, electromagnet uh, took, swiveled around, and went over to this compactor. It was bigger than the car, and he put the car, dropped the car in this compactor, and the compactor just went whoosh, and this car comes out like one twentieth of the size it was when it went in and it just compact everything down. Well, that's what we kind of have here in these two verses. It's like he's going to compact, he's going to put so much information in these two verses uh, as he, and he's going to use that as an introduction now to everything that's going to flow out of this uh, in the rest of Romans. I'd suggest, I put here also the rest of Ephesians. I'd suggest, as I said earlier, the, the book of the first epistle to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians, the Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, everything's going to flow out of this now. And beseeching is the key word here. That's uh, the first word here, if you ignore I, Paul, uh, beseech, that beseech, the first thing he's going to do is beseech them. It's a grace word. Uh, it doesn't command because commanding might preclude a response from the heart. You might just do something because you're commanded, uh, but he doesn't want to do that. He wants to beseech from the heart. Now, why does he want to beseech you from the heart? Well, because that's where the Holy Spirit's pouring out that agape love. That's the, the place uh, that Pauline Grace, Romans 6, 17, uh, that, uh, that God used to recreate the heart and then make it the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit who's pouring out that love. He wants a response from there. So he beseeches. He doesn't command. He beseeches. And in beseeching, uh, it's important to realize here some things, and I think this is a good practice for our, what we talked about last week with agape love. Uh, remember agape love? Uh, it, it says that all, uh, we think of the picture of Christ and the, in Philippians 2 there, although he was absolute God with all the privileges, all the rights, all the advantages, all the benefits of being absolute God, the creator God, and then what does it say? He didn't use them. He did not use them. Although not, and he didn't use them for his own benefit, but he used them for the benefit of others. Went to that cross for others. Uh, and that's really the stepping stones of this agape love. And the, when we think of beseeching, when Paul beseeches, you got to remember who Paul is. Paul is, the, is God's spokesman for today. Paul could command this. Paul could demand it. Paul could uh, use, he, he, Paul had all kinds of rights uh, because he's God's apostle. He has authority. He has apostolic authority. He could demand things. There's other times when he demands things and he commands things. But in this instance, he beseeches. He does, although he has the right and the power and the authority and the privilege and all that of uh, being God's spokesman for today, he's not going to use those things to force this on someone. He's, rather, he's going to, but he's going to uh, beseech them graciously uh, to present their bodies a living sacrifice so they can be built up. They can grow in maturity. They can ex bring uh, what's true of them in their position before God into their daily life, into their experience. 
So he beseeches for their benefit. A heart response is going to be infinitely better than an external uh, command response. And so in this way, they could not, they could respond not out of external religious region, reason, reasons. Uh, notice it says here in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. We're going to see what those mercies of God are, but of course it's everything we've been talking about, especially the end of Romans 11, especially Romans 9 to 11, especially 6 to 11, especially Romans 1 to 11. Uh, God's salvation package for the body of Christ. All those things he's graciously given to provide our full and complete salvation. It's based on that. He doesn't, he, uh, command, he doesn't command in a law system uh, to get so that they respond to gain a blessing uh, to, or, to may, or to gain a reward, uh, to gain a blessing or maintain a blessing or to escape a punishment. So that's the way the law works. If you do this, I will bless you. If you don't do it, I'll curse you. That's the way a law works. That's not how beseeching works. That's how a command works. Uh, beseeching says, God has already given you everything in Christ. Now I beseech you, use them, operate according to them. And so now they don't have to, if he commanded them, uh, they might respond out of a selfish interest to gain a reward, maintain a blessing, escape a punishment. Uh, all things uh, that wouldn't be, this would have been uh, produced by love, right? Love doesn't consider its own things. Love considers the things of others. And for Paul to come along and command uh, with obedience for blessing for obedience, uh, cursing for disobedience, a law system, it would take away, it would ruin the whole basis of agape love. So he beseeches them not to gain a, a reward or gain a blessing. God's already given you everything. If you're a believer here tonight, God has already blessed you with everything he has to give in Christ. Romans 5, we learn there that everything that belongs to Christ as head of the body of Christ belongs to us. We read in Ephesians 1, 3, he has already given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's already given them all. There's nothing to gain. There's nothing to pay, maintain. And you can't lose them. And Paul says, now on the basis of that, respond. Let love, the Holy Spirit, pour out that love in your heart and appreciation for what God, Christ has done on his cross uh, and the love of God displayed there. And operate, allow God to operate in accord with that in and through you. And you have this beseeching concept. And of course, uh, I guess, and of course, uh, the last point here, uh, that's basically the definition of agape love. You're going to see this throughout the whole passage. Even where the actual word love isn't used, uh, it, it, he uses the definition everywhere. And it's a good thing to uh, recognize that when it comes along. So beseeching rather than commanding calls for a heart response that can only come from agape love that flows out of Pauline grace by the Spirit working in the heart. All right, beseech is a grace word because God has already given the believer everything he has to give in Christ. There's nothing more, there's nothing to work for. There's nothing you can gain through your own performance, through your own power of the flesh. There's, it's already, everything's been given to you freely because of the personal work of Christ on the cross for you. Now he says, now operate in accord with those things. Realize you, how rich you are in Christ and operate in accord with that. Use those things not uh, for your own benefit and advantage, but for the benefit and advantage of others. Now you can use these things uh, with uh, securely. You don't have to worry uh, that you need to get something that someone else, you need to keep from somebody else because uh, you're afraid you're going to lose it or, or it's going to be reduced. Or You don't have to worry about any of that. 
eternally secure it, Romans 8. So it's a grace word uh, because God has already given the believer everything he has to give in Christ. Therefore, it is also a love word uh, because now the believer doesn't have to do anything out of selfish interest. How many believers I've uh, run into who have done, been doing things out of selfish interest. They think they're restoring their fellow, you know, they sin, so they have to do something to restore their fellowship with Christ, or they have to gain a reward in heaven, or they have to do this or do that to gain this, not lose that, get back, God's, uh, get back into God's good graces. Uh, uh, what confusion. God's given us everything in Christ, and it can't be diminished. It can't be taken away. It can't be diminished. It's everything. So you can freely, and let me also say this, the, everything we have in Christ, uh, it not only is permanent, it's infinite and eternal. So you can keep giving it away to others. You don't have to worry. You don't have to hoard it for yourself. You can keep giving it away to others because it's never going to run out. It's infinite. It's eternal. It lasts forever. And you can do it freely because you're completely secure in Christ. Nothing can change it. Not even, we saw in Romans 8, not even God himself can change it. So now freely dole out God's blessings. Dole out God's riches. You can do it freely because they're infinite and eternal. They're never going to run out. It's just something you can just do freely out of a, out of, from the heart. Not out of selfish interest, but out of uh, the way Christ did it, selflessly sharing and enjoying his blessings with others so that others can be built up in God's truth for today. So everything uh, revolves around that. And what we read that, uh, uh, we, you can see that, <clears throat> uh, especially in Romans 15, or excuse me, Romans 5, uh, 15 to 21, Ephesians 1, 3. Those are the verses that tell us that we have uh, everything that belongs to Christ belongs to us. Yeah, I'm not talking about things of, regarding his deity or anything. I'm talking about the things as he is the head of the body of Christ. Everything that belongs to us, him belongs to us. Uh, and Ephesians, all he's given us all the blessings he's given today. Now just allow him to work in and through you. Uh, he wants to use you to be his dispenser. Just throw out his riches to everyone that comes along. Throw out his forgiveness, his long-suffering, his joy, his peace, his salvation. His... And just keep doling it out. We see a beautiful example of this, and we'll probably uh, close uh, with this. Go to Philemon, and let's see a beautiful example of this, bringing in almost uh, every aspect of what I've been saying here. You remember the story of Philemon? Uh, I think back when I was about 14, and in one of these studies, we actually covered Philemon. It seems like 100 years ago now. Uh, but we actually did the book of Philemon. So hopefully some uh, are still a little bit familiar with that. Philemon had a slave called Onesimus. Uh, he lived in the Colossae area. Uh, Paul is in, in uh, Roman jail. And uh, apparently, you don't know all the details, but Onesimus uh, stole something perhaps, did something wrong to, uh, to Philemon uh, and ran away became a ran runaway slave and he ran to Rome probably because Rome was the biggest city uh, and he maybe thought he could get lost there. People wouldn't find him there. He'd be just another one of the, the uh, hundreds of thousands. Uh, but it turns out he goes to Rome and one way or another he connects with Paul. Paul's in prison and he goes and somehow connects with Paul in prison uh, and Paul, and Paul uh, through the gospel, saves him brings him unto justification, unto eternal life through the, his gospel. And he's going to now plead with, uh, with Philemon, beseech, I guess would be a better word than plead, beseech by Philemon to uh, accept 
Onesimus back again. Not as a, just, not as a returned slave in the world, uh, but as a returning brother in Christ. And he's going to beseech him. We'll pick it up here. And let's read, pick it up at verse 8. And Philemon, verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, to force you, uh, to enjoin thee, force thee, that which is convenient, to do that which is uh, convenient, that which is right. Uh, Paul says here, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. I could force you to do this. I could demand it. I could command it. I'm God's spokesman. Uh, I could um, make you do this. But look what he says. He's not going to use his rights, his privileges, his advantages, uh, and his authority uh, as God's spokesman. Instead, he's going to do this. Look how he appeals to him. Verse 9, yet for love's sake. There we have our agape love for beseeching as a love word. For love's sake, I rather beseech thee. Beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not going to, although I have the right and the power and the authority and the privilege of, of commanding this of you, it's the right thing to do. I'm not going to do it that way. I'm not going to do it that way, but I'm going to beseech you for love's sake so that your reception of Onesimus isn't because I forced you. Your, love, your reception of Onesimus is because of the love of God uh, overflowing in your heart. The love of God especially. Uh, Philemon might have been thinking of Onesimus as an enemy. The love of God at the cross of Christ for his enemies, for the ungodly, for sinners. And based on that response, love overflowing his heart. And he was, uh, Paul wanted him to receive Onesimus for that reason. Not because Paul forced him, but because out of a heart of agape love, Philemon received Onesimus back. So he beseeches him so that love can be the underlying reason. Love can be the underlying motivating force. Love can be the geyser that pushes Philemon up uh, to receive Onesimus. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Uh, it appears that he was saved through uh, Paul's preaching of the gospel to him while he was in jail there. Verse 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now is now profitable to thee and to me. And there's a real play in words here. Anesimus' name actually means profitable. So the one whose name is profitable became unprofitable. And now he's profitable again. And Paul is beseeching him to receive him back, not as uh, primarily a returned slave in the world standards, but as a, a returning brother in Christ, where now he's profitable. He'll be profitable to Philemon, and he's profitable to Paul. He's ministering for Christ. Uh, now Onesimus is ministering uh, according to this love, ministering to Paul, and he'll go and minister to Philemon. And, all out of love. Verse 12, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. That is of, of mine own bowels, my own, uh, the soft area of the inner man. Uh, and they use the, the English here would use the word bowels, uh, you know, the soft point. Uh, we, maybe we would just call it the heart, um, the soft area that he has for him. Uh, and he's worried about him. He's sick for him, not necessarily physically, but that weak spine in your stomach uh, that gets, uh, gets a little butterflies in your stomach. He's, he's got that weak spine in the, in the stomach, and he wants Philemon to receive him back. He wants to be, him to bring him back into a right relationship. Verse 13, whom I have retained with me, that in my stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity. See, here we, he doesn't want to force this 
on Philemon. Here you have agape love again. The word isn't here in these verses, but it's agape love. Got Paul a knee, has a need. Paul needs Onesimus to minister to him. He's in jail. He probably liked all the help he could get, and Onesimus was willing to do it once he was saved. But if Paul didn't consider his own things, he considered the things of Philemon. So you know what he's going to do? He's going to send Onesimus, whom he needs for his needs, but he's not going to consider those needs, and he's going to send Onesimus back to Philemon for his needs. That's agape love in action. He's not going to consider his own things. He considers the things of Philemon, and he's willing to give up Onesimus and send him back to Philemon. And he says here, but without thy mind, verse 14, would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not, as it were, be a necessity, but willingly from the heart uh, for love's sake, to be motivated by love, the geyser of agape love. How much better that is than me commanding you and getting you to do something uh, that uh, I'm insisting is right. It allows for a love response. For perhaps, therefore, verse 15, he therefore departed for a season uh, that thou shouldest receive him forever. He departed as a runaway slave for a short time, but he's coming back an everlasting brother. And for love's sake, I beseech you, receive him. Let's close with a word of prayer. 